is the 36th uh, symposium of the ISDP. It will be in New Delhi in November. And uh, actually, if you are looking at the uh, faculty, then you can uh, see here Dr. Robson's name. So he's also going to be there. I'm, I'm curious what he's going to talk about there. Uh, this invitation is by Dr. Raman, Dr. Singh, and Dr. Kanpur. And uh, the scientific uh, program will be excellent. As you can see, there is a, a fantastic faculty uh, here. And also, if you can make it, please do, because uh, this part of the world is also extremely exotic and has a lot of uh, tourist uh, attraction. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Robson. Uh, who uh, graduated from the University of Birmingham with honors in medicine and having previously gained a first class degree in pathology. He was a clinical lecturer in pathology at the University of Oxford for almost four years and subsequently appointed consultant dermatopathologist at St. John's Institute of Dermatology London. The St. John's Institute is a, is a fantastic place for dermatopathology and there Dr. Robson was the pathology lead in cutaneous lymphoma. And also he was the UK representative of the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer of Cutaneous Lymphoma. So this is basically, he was the ORTC representative of the UK. He taught and supervised the dermatopathology course at King's College London for 14 years. He published over 100 papers in dermatopathology and presented and spoken at numerous national and international meetings in the UK as well in Europe, in the USA and in Asia. In 2014, he left St. John's Institute and is now visiting pathologist as, as Lisbon Institute of Oncology, Portugal, and a consultant dermatopathologist for LDPath, a private company, and maintains active teaching and research commitments. And uh, you know, it is a great honor for us to have him on the program today. And uh, I basically know him just a couple of years personally, but I have been reading a lot of, of his papers uh, for a long time. And whenever you will see a paper coming out of uh, uh, his group, you will see that it is always attacking something really, really interesting, or it is about uh, an interesting finding that we can uh, use for the diagnosis of cutaneous diseases. He also, the one that uh, he has a no-nonsense no approach to things, so uh, if you meet him at meetings, he's always the one who is asking the critical question. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is the first time I have done this, so I'm not sure, uh, forgive me if I um, uh, occasionally um, have to uh, think of a couple of times. I don't know whether this is interactive or people interrupt as I go along or whether it is just that you sit and listen. Uh, you can make it interactive. Uh, basically, uh, one thing that I could suggest to use your arrows, because if you are moving your arrows, you can point out with, yeah, exactly, I can see your arrows. And Fine. you can also ask questions. We usually mute the audience because uh, there will be some uh, interference. Yeah. Uh, however, we have a chat window and I'm moderating this uh, session. So if anyone has a question or if you have a question, please ask. And then the audience is usually typing their answers or asking at the end of the lecture their questions. And I will tell it to you or, or you can open up the chat window and see yourself. But it is a little bit too much to concentrate on the lecture and on the questions. So I'm going to cover the, uh, the, the chatting window for you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you're there to moderate. Um, well, um, as I said, um, I, I, I'm going to... Uh, talk for about 45 minutes on lichenoid dermatoses. Um, I principally have approached this from the point of view of diagnosis. Um, it is very easy to go to books to look up, for example, um, complex criteria of autoantibodies in lupus erythematosus and their associations. But I have approached this principally from the purpose of diagnostic pathology. Um, I am an informal person. I do not mind being interrupted for questions or heckling or disagreements or what have you. So please feel free to chip in as I go along. Um, 
before we start, I think one of the clearly most important things is to um, define the subject matter, lichenoid. Um, and um, I'm also, I have to say, conscious I'm, I'm not entirely certain how experienced people are, and I presume it varies from the uh, very junior to some senior. So the senior people occasionally will have to bear with me, um, but um, hopefully uh, there will be something for everyone. So what is a lichenoid process? From a histopathology point of view, a lichenoid pattern is one in which the center of gravity of the process is located at the dermo-epidermal junction. As such, it is synonymous with an interface dermatitis. That defines the pattern we are uh, currently speaking about. Uh, I'm not going to go into um, elaborate theories of pathogenesis, and these do, of course, vary with different disease types. But a common sort of schema involves a trigger, be it a virus, a drug, or cell damage from some mechanism, uh, which is then processed by Langerhan cells with T cell activation and often cytotoxic mediated damage to keratinocytes. These then undergo apoptosis, becoming colloid bodies, which we will uh, mention, further eliciting inflammation. That common schema is the basis for many um, lichenoid processes and has been well established in animal models. All well and good, but how do we recognize a lichenoid process in a biopsy? Well, there are one of three principal ways. One is lymphocytes gather at the dermoepidermal junction. The second is there is evidence of keratinocyte damage through vacuolar change in the basal epidermal layer. This is also known as liquefactive and hydropic degeneration. The third key um, indicator that we might be dealing with a lichenoid process is the presence of apoptotic keratinocytes, which, towards the end of their, um, the process, form colloid bodies. These are eosinophilic globules of clumped cytokeratin filaments. They are synonymous with savat and cytoid bodies. So let's illustrate some of those. This is a lichenoid inflammatory cell infiltrate because the lymphocytes, if you can see my arrow, are principally distributed at the dermoepidermal junction. You'll note that the upper epidermis is relatively clear of lymphocytes. And for those, if you can see the, just the portion of the dermis down here, it is becoming to be also uninflamed. So the, as I used the phrase before, center of gravity is here. And that tells me that this is lichenoid. This is also lichenoid, but in this instance, we have a few lymphocytes, which you will also notice this vacuolar change in the keratinocytes in the basal layer. This indicates um, from experimental models, sublethal cell damage, and is a further indication of damage at the dermoepidermal junction, therefore a lichenoid or interface dermatitis. Remember, this is vacuolar change, liquefactive change, or hydropic change. Colloid bodies are these eosinophilic amorphous globules of cytokeratin filaments, which I am circling with my arrow here and here. If you note, there is a similar body here, but with a pycnotic nucleus. This indicates that these colloid bodies are in fact the final pathway of keratinocyte apoptosis and a common associate um, association with lichenoid inflammation. Commonly found in lichenoid inflammation, but not defining it, is the presence of melanin pigment incontinence as seen here, and I'm showing this with the arrows. Um, as you get damage to the basal epidermis, and you may well ask here, where is the stratum basalis? Well, you can't see it because it's been destroyed. Once that happens and you get damage to keratinocytes, you get liberation of melanin. However, this is not uh, specific to lichenoid processes. So in summary, if you look at these photomicrographs here, on the top left, we have a, a um, clearly lymphocyte, uh, lymphocytic infiltrate, which is clearly concentrated at the dermoepidermal junction. 
On this uh, photomicrograph, we have vacuole change in the basal keratinocytes. In this photomicrograph, we have colloid bodies. All three indicate a lichenoid dermatitis. And this just serves to remind us that we may then see melanin incontinence. So whilst these patterns may all represent lichenoid dermatitis, how do we then distinguish between the various diseases that can um, elicit this pattern? Well, they differ. And they differ in the amount of inflammation, the amount of vacuolar change, the number and location of colloid bodies, and various other sundry observations. So, the three contributory um, diagnostic parameters of a lichenoid dermatitis, lymphocytes, vacuolar chain, and colloid body, may or may not all be present in a particular disease, and the contribution of each of those to the dermatopathology varies between diseases. And it is on that basis, together with other observations in the biopsy, that can lead us to a correct diagnosis. This list is not exhaustive, even if it's exhausting. And it is many of the um, common diseases, and some rare, I have to say, that manifest with a lichenoid inflammatory cell pattern, or mimicking a lichenoid inflammatory cell pattern, in the case of these lesions down here, that are neoplastic rather than inflammatory. I can't cover them all, um, and it is likely, I mean, I've got a timer to my right, um, I may get pushed for time, so I may end up skipping a few, um, a few of these more quicker than I would like to do. But we will do our best to get through these. Lichen planus, as you know, is a typically a um, purple or violaceous papular disease, uh, often intensely pruritic and to uh, topped with Wickham stria, the, the pale areas. Very pruritic, as you can see here, there's multiple excoriations. In a way, it is the paradigm of the lichenoid inflammatory cell infiltrate. What do we see histologically? Well, um, as I said, you can probably get this from the books, but I want to emphasize a few things that I find helpful. One is pseudoacanthosis. The epidermis is thickened in a particular fashion, and I will illustrate this. Um, the second is to emphasize that lichen planus is usually characterized by lymphocytic infiltrate rather than prominent vacuolar degeneration. Of course, you may see vacuolar change, but usually the striking thing that hits you when you look, uh, look at the slide is the number of lymphocytes and possibly the number of colloid bodies rather than vacuolar change. Characteristically, the damage to the reti ridges gives a sawtooth reti ridge pattern. An important negative, parakeratosis is not usually present. So here is a classic lichen planus with hyperkeratosis, no parakeratosis. There is a little bit of hypergranulosis. And here is the inflammatory cell infiltrate, very much concentrated at the dermoepidermal junction. There you have an apoptotic keratinocyte. Strictly speaking, it's not a colloid body because it has a nucleus, but it is the same process and has the same indication. You probably cannot see at this power vacuola change, and that just reinforces that the most, uh, the biggest contributor to the lichenoid pattern in lichen planus is lymphocytes, as seen here, closer up with the apoptotic cell. This is what I mean by pseudoacanthosis. Again, we have the lichenoid inflammatory cell infiltrate. This is thickened. But if you look carefully, it's thickened not so much because the number of cells have increased, which would be hyperplasia and acanthosis. It is thickened because the constituent cells are so-called swollen or hypertrophic. So in a way, it's, it's sometimes described as pseudoacanthosis. I find that useful. I do not see it in um, other lichenoid dermatoses. Here's an instance where the reti ridges have been completely effaced. You have a band-like uh, infiltrate, but it's not just that this infiltrate is very um, high up in the epidermis. That in itself does not make it lichenoid. Look how it is eating the epidermis and the reti ridges have disappeared. Closer up, slightly pixelated, but where are the reti ridges? Gone. And there you have a, a dominant lymphoid infiltrate at the epidermal, uh, dermal epidermal junction. There's the case I illustrated earlier. I don't think we need 
to concentrate on that. Occasionally, one of the features is in, in, in because of the loss of the stratum basalis, you are left with the prickle cell layer forming the basal um, point of the epidermis, so-called squamatization. And sometimes this can be so pronounced as to cause clefting or spaces known as Max Joseph spaces, and this is one I borrowed from the internet, and you can see the subepidermal cleft, and this is due to considerable basal epidermal damage. Bearing in mind, not everything we see that looks like lichen planus is lichen planus. Um, a nice case here written up um, in which the not only was it clinically it looked like lichen planus and histologically was compatible, but actually um, it turned out to be linear IgA on immunofluorescence and serology. Hypertrophic lichen planus, I don't have a clinical picture, but this is important because it can actually be uh, mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma. Why? Because the acanthosis can be so marked and so irregular and the lymphoid infiltrate uh, not as prominent and therefore um, it is mistaken for a squamous cell carcinoma, particularly as clinically it forms nodules. Um, this, is more, uh, this is further complicated by case reports of malignancy supervening on hypertrophic lichen planus. Here is an instance where you can see um, a marked acanthosis, and although there is inflammation, you'd be forgiven for thinking this may just be a rather nonspecific reaction rather than the actual uh, lichenoid dermatitis pattern. As you get, uh, here's another example. Here it's slightly more obvious. You can see this reti is attacked by lymphoid cells. And in this instance, you can see why it might be mistaken for squamous cell carcinoma, particularly if the clinical query is of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. I draw your attention down here where the uh, circle is, a bit of some atypia. It looks as though it's broken off from the epidermis. It's just cross-cut, of course. And we have a lichenoid inflammatory cell infiltrate with loss of the stratum basalis all along this point here. So uh, another feature of hypertrophic lichen planus is parakeratosis is more prevalent. Uh, even hypertrophic lichen planus, and this is um, some nice illustrations of how nodular it can be, can actually be drug induced. Lichen planus pigmentosis is one of the many variants of lichen planus. Typically occurs in the tropics on uh, pigmented skin types and is essentially uh, the same except melanin pigment incontinence is usually far more florid. Lichen nitidus. This is a, uh, an uncommon dermatitis. You can see here the characteristic clinical features of flesh-shaped uh, dome or flat-topped papules, often in children or young adults, on the arms and chest and abdomen, sometimes genitalia. Mucosal involvement is exceptional. Um, nail involvement is also very rare. But it does have a very distinctive histology. And on scanning magnification, the, the diagnosis is often made. In this, you see a localized collection of macrophages or histiocytes and lymphocytes within the, if you will, claws of two adjacent reti ridges. Elsewhere, you may see lichen planus like features. And here is a spot diagnosis. Between these reti ridges, you can see the lymphocytes, but also this area of pala denoting the macrophages. The lichenoid element here is limited. It does vary. You can see it here. There is, in fact, damage at the dermal epidermal junction. Here's one I uh, borrowed from the internet, and it's got a more florid, clear interface dermatitis. And again, macrophage rich. Interestingly, um, I alluded to the fact that in lichen nitidus, you can see um, occasionally changes of lichen planus elsewhere. The converse is also true. Whilst lichen planus and lichen nitidus should be considered discrete dermatides, there is no doubt in some instances within a biopsy you do see elements of both. This is a case I had a few weeks ago and it was uh, clinically lichen planus and you can see some areas there consistent with lichen planus and actually on the second biopsy from the same patient there's an area rather reminiscent of lichen nitidus. Here's an interesting case we saw at St. John's. A young child who has a orange um, erythro, um, erythematous papular squamous uh, eruption uh, which started on his head and pre uh, then proceeded cordially. You can see it has a very follicular 
base here, very follicular prominence with limited scale. This was very interesting because one biopsy showed what we expected to see, which was varying um, bands of parakeratosis with orthokeratosis and psoriasiform hyperplasia, indicative of what the diagnosis is, which is type 5 pityriasis rubra pilaris. This was a second biopsy, and I can put this in an atlas for lichen nititis. And this has now formed the basis, um, here uh, just to show you close up, it's exactly the same histology, it's lichenoid infiltrated with lymphocytes and macrophages. We have now written up three cases with um, pityriasis rubra pilaris with features of lichen nititis not um, hitherto reported. Having said that, pityriasis rubra pilaris is well known to have anomalous histology on rare occasions. These include acanthalysis and lichenoid histology, which can mimic lichen planus. The lichen nitidus pattern um, had not been uh, reported until we made that observation. This is a case of, like, of uh, pityriasis rubra pilaris, just to emphasize you can get an acanthalytic pattern. Lucas erythematosus is, again, one of the cardinal uh, lichenoid dermatoses. Um, as you know, probably um, just as well and possibly even better than me, um, it, this can vary from very limited cutaneous disease to a multi-system life-threatening disorder. There are many different types. This, this list is not um, uh, the complete story. But the three principal uh, presentations we see in adults to dermatopathology and dermatology fall under these categories of discoid, acute, and subacute. In lupus erythematosus of any kind, it is a lichenoid dermatosis, but it's one in which often, not always, vacuoli changes are more pronounced than, for example, we have just seen in lichen planus. Furthermore, there are other um, uh, histological abnormalities that can uh, lead us to the correct diagnosis. One can be the presence of dermal mucin, which of course one has to stain for, but the other is often in uh, particularly discoid lupus erythematosus, the most common form that um, I see as a dermatopathologist, the striking low power image is not lichenoid, but a superficial and deep perivascular inflammatory cell infiltrate. This is a patient with discoid lupus erythematosus. Note the atrophy and the induration and erythema. These are fixed plaques. This is a heavily inflamed skin. This is not just in the epidermis. And here you see it, a scanning magnification. And you are not drawn to the epidermis or the lichenoid inflammation. You are drawn to this superficial and deep perivascular and perinexal inflammation. This is the kind of pattern we often find that, and I don't wish to uh, denigrate any general pathologist who may be listening, uh, general pathologist often feels is a non-specific pattern. But actually it is highly characteristic of lupus erythematosus, this perivascular periagnexal going into the subcutis, and again. In this instance, which has the same features, periagnexal, superficial, and deep perivascular, you get the hint now there is some epidermal change in this case. And sure enough, as you get closer, in this instance, we have lymphocytes at a dermal epidermal junction. We have a little bit of vacuole change, but we have marked basement membrane thickening. Basement membrane thickening is a very useful histological parameter in lupus erythematosus, also seen in lichen sclerosis and GVHD. The lymphoid infiltrate, which here surrounds adnexi, um, characteristically contains lots of plasma cells, and that's a helpful feature in lupus erythematosus. Another example to uh, cement the idea, very prominent superficial and deep perivascular inflammation, but here at this power you can already see this has epidermal inflammation. And on closer inspection you see vacuola change and basement membrane thickening. And on this in, uh, photomicrograph you see vacuola change um, and perhaps not some basement membrane thickening there and some lymphocytes. So, just to recap, if you look at this, this is clearly lichenoid, but it does not look like the pattern we just saw in lichen planus. The respective contributions of the vacuole change and the pattern of the lymphocytes are different. Acute lupus erythematosus, while clinically may be very striking, is easily missed. 
histologically. It's often subtle. The inflammation can be very slight. Not only that, the superficial and deep perivascular element may be missing. This I've had to put on um, high power to show you the vacuola change that you can see in acute lupus, and they have a apoptotic retina site and uh, another one there. It is quite striking how um, the how subtle the um, histology is, often in comparison to the clinical picture. Here's an example which is uh, more florid, and again you have vacuola change, apoptotic keratinocytes, and some lymphocytes. Subacute lupus erythematosus um, is typically characterized by these annular uh, plaques and histologically often has numerous apoptotic keratinocytes and can really mimic a drug eruption or erythema multiforme. Here's an instance where you have an awful lot of vacuola change. You can see it along the basal epidermal layer and here, and uh, a number of apoptotic keratinocytes and collared bodies at all levels in the epidermis, not just in the basal layer. As an aside, um, recently it has been um, suggested that immunohistochemistry for plasmacytodendritic cells that express CD123 and are important in the type 1 um, immune response can be diagnostically useful in challenging cases. This is an example of discoid lupus erythematosus stained for CD123 and shows the characteristic numerous cells that you see in the infiltrate, often forming clumps. This paper um, found uh, immunohistochemistry for CD123 was extremely helpful in distinguishing lupus erythematosus from one of its potential mimics, polymorphous flight eruption, which was also characterized by a superficial and deep perivascular inflammatory cell infiltrate. Note none of those ca their cases stained with CD123. Similarly, um, an Italian group who published in the Journal of Cutaneous Pathology and found that they were uh, CD123 positive cells were seen in both lupus erythematosus and Jesmus lymphocytic infiltrate. On the basis of this, they um, proposed that these are the same disease. I, um, I think that can be criticized, but nevertheless, it is an interesting observation. They too did not see these aggregates of cells in polymorphous light eruption amongst other dermatitoses. So here's some examples. This is a lupus erythematosus uh, with a red chromogen, and you can see the heavy infiltrate of CD123 positive um, plasmacytodendritic cells. The same in Jesner's lymphocytic infiltrate, um, non in polymorphic light eruption, and in perniosis, which of course also has a superficial and deep infiltrate and uh, can also show lymphocytic vasculitis, um, had occasional cells. Dermatomyositis, I'm going to just mention very quickly because um, I just to skirt over, this is essentially, from our point of view as histopathologists, it's indistinguishable from acute lupus erythematosus. It is a subtle dermatosis with apoptosis at the dermoepidermal junction of vacuola change rather than, in most cases, a heavy inflammatory cell infiltrate. Parenthetically, I wanted to mention Stills disease. I haven't seen many biopsies of this. Um, and I'm afraid I don't have a clinical picture. But just to emphasize an important diagnostic point, should you ever be uh, facing a case. It is said in the literature that this is characterized by very little information, but apoptotic uh, um, uh, keratinocytes and collared bodies high up in the epidermis. And this is a case I had about a year ago now, and it does indeed show that exactly. Here's one reported much earlier on in the literature in one of the earlier case reports, identical histology. So this seems, for some reason, to be characteristic of still disease, and it seems to be a helpful diagnostic parameter. Lichen sclerosis is um, usually a spot diagnosis. We're all familiar with the clinical presentation. There is genital, uh, commonly genital, but also extragenital forms. It is pruritic and they form white linear plaques, as seen here on the shaft of the penis. It can be bullous. There is an overlap, um, which it can be, uh, is challenging both nosologically and diagnostically with superficial morphia. What do we see with lichen sclerosis? Well, in the early changes, 
we see active lichenoid inflammation, often patchy. You do not tend to see much vacuolar change and colloid bodies are not usually conspicuous. You may see, as I alluded to earlier, basement membrane thickening. In the early stages, there can be some edema of the papillary dermis. I'll come back to the fact that it can mimic mycosis fungoides in a moment. And here's an active phase. So we've got lymphocytes at the dermoepidermal junction. We don't really have uh, much vacuolar change, and I can't really see many vacu um, cytoid bodies. Note the already the sclerotic appearance of the collagen. Later, the or, or more advanced disease, the lichenoid inflammation becomes less conspicuous, sclerosis becomes more conspicuous, and indeed at the end there may be very little inflammation at all. The sclerosis appears to push the lichenoid inflammation away, such as we're left with this band-like sclerosis area here, and the inflammation is pushed down here. But closer inspection usually reveals that there is some uh, extant inflammation. My point about the uh, similarity with mycosis fungoides is it is one of those um, forms of dermatitis that the lymphocytes can appear as though they are colonizing the basal epidermis rather than attacking it. This is not the case, for example, in lichen planus or in most cases of lupus erythematosus, but I do find it repeatable, uh, repeatedly in lichen sclerosis. Erythema multiforme is a um, uh, serious uh, uh, dermatitis. It can, of course, be an emergency. Typically in young adults after drugs or um, viral related where targetoid lesions appear, particularly on apical sites, and the characteristic histology here is not only is it uh, lymphocytic lichenoid, but you will see many colloid bodies. So again, to emphasize, uh, if you remember the three contributors to lichenoid inflammation, lymphocytes, vacuolar change, colloid bodies, erythema multiforme is one in which lymphocytes and particularly colloid bodies are conspicuous. You may see vasculitis in some cases, particularly if related to herpes infection. On scanning magnification, we can see there's not much in the dermis here. We've got a, a lichenoid lymphocytic infiltrate, and you can see the bright pink or red already of those apoptotic cratinocytes, which are numerous. These may become more confluent. Here you can see them forming um, collections of apoptotic cells, which if they become confluent, slough off. This epidermis is basically all necrotic. Note this is re-epithelialized, and that can be a source of diagnostic um, uh, um, confusion in some instances. You can still see, however, there is ongoing lichenoid inflammation with lymphocytes and apoptotic cratinocytes. Should they become completely confluent, then you get wholly necrotic epidermis. This is typically what you see in the severe forms of erythema multiforme, including Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and where clinically it starts to form toxic epidermal necrolysis. And this isn't surprising. Look at the epidermis here. It's completely necrotic. It just lifts off in a sheet. Like no drug reactions. Drug react reactions um, can adopt almost any histological pattern. Having said that, the lichenoid pattern is probably the most common. Again, if you look at the what we um, considered at the beginning of the contributions to lichenoid inflammation, the, one of the characteristic features, the key features of a lichenoid drug eruption is the presence of apoptotic keratinocytes. And uh, these and colloid bodies can be found at various levels in the epidermis. Please note that you may see eosinophils, you may not. I always teach that eosinophils may be seen, uh, may indicate, may be seen in a drug eruption, but it may be seen in many other things. And in many drug eruptions, you may not see eosinophils. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. This is to remind me that when uh, um, uh, you're considering drug reactions, it can be anything. Uh, I'm always uh, very pleased when a clinician writes query drug reaction on the request form uh, because I don't have to look at the slide 
I can almost uh, fill in a report saying yes, because whatever I see is probably compatible with a drug reaction. Um, having said that, the lichenoid drug reactions, the histology often is very similar to lichen planus and erythema and or erythema multiforme. And if you think you're looking at lichen planus or erythema multiforme and you note parakeratosis and you note eosinophils, then you should think of a drug reaction. Here are some lichenoid uh, papules across um, this gentleman's back. And here you see um, a typical histology where you have many lymphocytes, or oh, sorry, a number of lymphocytes, but many colloid bodies and apoptotic keratinocytes. Here's another example I had uh, just a bit um, earlier in the week. We have parakeratosis. We have a lichenoid inflammatory cell infiltrate with pigment incontinence. And I'm not sure this conveys very well on my screen, but here are numerous eosinophils. And that was characteristic of a lichenoid uh, drug eruption. Um, the, numerous drugs can cause uh, lichenoid drug eruptions, and this includes the new biologics. And with the increasing advent of these, we are seeing lichenoid drug eruptions more commonly. Um, interestingly, as an aside, omeprazole seems to be linked with lichenoid drug eruption um, quite. Um, uh, quite a number of reports in the literature and interestingly tends to be associated with vacuola change as you can see here and in some instances has precipitated acute lupus erythematosis which of course is often characterized by um, vacuola change. This is to remind me that um, dress syndrome can be associated with lichenoid dermatitis. As you know, uh, DRESS syndrome has a clinical and um, laboratory parameter, uh, it is diagnosed but on clinical grounds with various laboratory parameters. It does not have a fixed histopathology, but a very common histopathology, as I've indicated on the right of this slide, is um, uh, an, uh, an infiltrate which has a lichenoid pattern. So in, in the clinical situation of a, a, a clinician asking if there is dress syndrome, lichenoid dermatitis is wholly compatible with that. Uh, acute GBHD is a lichenoid dermatosis. It is um, typically um, after bone marrow transplants, though it can occur after solid organ transplants. Uh, while there are a variety of manifestations, the cutaneous eruptions are usually an erythematous or macular rash, often on the apical sites or the genitalia. Here's an example of a macular papular rash, apical. And what do we see here? What is the characteristic that can help us distinguish a uh, acute GVHD? Well, it's the so-called satellite cell necrosis. In this, you have an apoptotic keratinocyte which has a lymphocyte juxtaposed to it. I'll illustrate this. The more florid versions of acute GVHD just have more of this, and of course, that can lead to the whole epidermis being sloughed off. There is a grading scheme for this, um, and this is depicted here, although it is available in textbooks. Basically, as it becomes more florid, you go towards losing the epidermis, and in fact, a pattern which again can mimic toxic epidermal necrolysis. So here's an instance of acute um, graft versus host disease, and already I think you can see there is a smattering of lymphocytes at the dermal epidermal junction. But note here, we have lymphocytes and we have apoptotic keratinocytes adjacent. If you note, just there. This is a vacuolated. Um, this space is shrinkage artifact from this apoptotic keratinocyte, which has now formed a colored body. This is the guilty lymphocyte, which has killed it, the so-called kiss of death. So that is satellite cell necrosis, a lymphocyte adjacent to an apoptotic uh, keratinocyte or colored body, similar here. Characteristic of acute GVHD. This is to remind us that chronic GVHD, which you see here, which is outside the scope of the lecture, but has a more fear-like pattern, can still see ongoing acute GVHD, which you can see in the inset here with a kiss of death, represented there with a lymphocyte, an apoptotic keratinocyte. 
This is to remind us that uh, GVHD can occur um, following solid or organ transplants, but not only that, you should bear in mind, it can occur following the blood transfusion. Paraneoplastic pemphigus may seem an odd inclusion for a lichenodermatitis um, lecture, but probably the most common, or at least one of the most common histological patterns you will see in paraneoplastic pemphigus is lichenoid inflammation. Remember, this is an acute dermatitis. It presents with often uh, painful erosions, particularly on mucosal surfaces, surfaces. It is associated with a variety of neoplasms, particularly B-cell lymphomas. It has been described without malignancy. Here are some uh, mucositis and erosions um, sloughing off uh, of superficial sheets of skin. And while it has a variable histology, which partly reflects the fact immunofluorescence will often uh, illustrate a variety of target antigens, one of the most common histological patterns you'll see, as I said, is lichenoid uh, with or without acantholysis. Here is an in instance with acantholysis, and here is an example with florid lichenoid inflammation at the dermal epidermal junction. Numerous lymphocytes, numerous apoptotic keratinocytes. You may already have uh, garnered, um, uh, gleaned that um, in this instance, one of the clinical differential diagnoses will, of course, be erythema multiforme. And you have to say that it is very difficult to look at this and exclude erythema multiforme. That is why we use immunofluorescence. And what you want to see is that specific staining of transitional epithelium of the rat bladder, which is diagnostic, indeed pathognomonic, of pineoplastic pemphigus. Computerized like an oides group embraces a spectrum of disorders from PLEVO or pityriasis lichenoides avariformis acuta and pityriasis lichenoides chronica. These typically occur in young people and have a polymorphic eruption. They come in crops. They um, are small papules that become necrotic and heal. The spectrum at one end is PLEVO where there is a florid lymphocytic infiltrate um, lichenoid and often conspicuous apoptotic keratinocytes and prominent red cell extravasation. This is associated with a superficial and deep perivascular cell, uh, inflammatory cell infiltrate. You may see neutrophils in the corneal layer. Despite this florid histology, pityriasis lichenoides chronica at the extreme end is very subtle and easily missed. This is a florid example of um, a, uh, a pityriasis lichenoides with obscuring of the dermoepidermal junction by lymphocytes. This, in contrast, is a subtle um, example of uh, pityriasis lichenoides chronica at the other end of the spectrum. Here you can see some red cell extravasation, and here you see the subtle uh, parakeratosis or mica scale, which is seen clinically, which is typical of the disease. This is easily missed or easily um, confused with um, and can be challenging to tell from uh, a spongiotic dermatitis. We know that syphilis is the great mimicker, secondary syphilis um, particularly, but of the numerous histological patterns that syphilis can um, um, present, again, lichenoid is one of the most frequent. Clues to syphilis include plasma cells and thickened capillaries, and then, of course, um, either serology is done uh, by the clinician, or you may demonstrate the organism by immunohistochemistry. In secondary syphilis, in, in, indeed, do not be surprised if you have admixed granulometer, which can be seen in the later stages. Uh, this is an example of the maculopapular rash, non pruritic And here's an example of one we had at St. John's. And you can see a rather delicate um, lichenoid infiltrate with lymphocytes um, sparsely scattered at the dermoepidermal junction. But this is lichenoid. This is enough to say this is lichenoid. It isn't up here in the upper epidermis. It is conspicuously at the dermoepidermal junction. Uh, just uh, as a nod to um, a point I made earlier, note the eosinophils. Not everything with eosinophils is a drug.
we do have plasma cells, which um, of course are often seen in syphilis. Similarly, viral exam inflammatory and seroconversion reactions, um, uh, which are seldom biopsy, can be lichenoid and are often subtle with variable numbers of apoptotic keratinocytes. This is a patient who um, had measles who presented um, with uh, casualty at, at um, Guys in St. Thomas's Hospital, and you've got a subtle interface dermatitis with lymphocytes just nibbling away at the dermoepidermal junction and a perivascular inflammatory cell infiltrate. Similarly here, this is an HIV seroconversion reaction, and you can be forgiven for thinking there's not much going on, it's perivascular, and there seems to be a little bit of interest in the epidermis, but as you get closer, you do actually see lymphocytes at the dermoepidermal junction, and indeed here, a little bit of vacuolar change. Lichen striatus um, is an interesting condition. It is rare. It's more common in children. It is often uh, arises in the summer. It um, is self-limiting. It usually resolves, albeit slowly, and typically takes of an erythematous or lichenoid uh, eruption or papules, particularly on the leg with a linear pattern, hence the name. And this is a lovely example. You can see there's linear papules running down the leg of this uh, relatively young uh, patient, and is not only lichenoid, is known as the chameleon, because it can have a number of patterns together in the same biopsy, so do not be surprised if you see a spongiotic dermatitis uh, in addition to clearly lichenoid inflammation and lichen striatus. And here we have got lymphocytes at the dermoepidermal junction, we've got numerous apoptotic keratinocytes and collared bodies in addition. One of the helpful features of lichen striatus is there is almost always a deep periadnexal inflammatory cell infiltrate admixed. Um, this again, going back to my point about biologics, has been reported as being induced by etanocept. Um, I haven't got time, um, but it is an interesting uh, point um, to consider the relationship between lichen striatus and blaschkitis. Blaschkitis being the term for inflammatory eruptions on a blaschkoid distribution, um, which can therefore, because of their configuration, um, readily mimic lichen striatus. And many people, uh, or not many people, but some people feel that these are actually shades of the same disease. However, this table here in this paper interestingly pointed out some differences. For example, lichen striatus is a usually a disease of children, blaschkitis adults. Uh, lichen striatus is typically on the limbs, blaschkitis is on the trunk, and uh, blaschkitis often relapses, which lichen striatus doesn't. Not only that, blaschkitis is not always lichenoid, but maybe spongiotic. Having said that, I've already alluded to the variable histology of lichen striatus. I have not seen knowingly a case of this, um, but I'm aware of it, and therefore I feel I ought to um, uh, mention this, annular lichenoid dermatitis of youth. Um, this is a, a, a rare but relatively recently recognized um, dermatitis. Uh, while it has been described principally in youth, there, are, there have now been some cases described in adults, and these are very polymorphic, polycyclic, um, um, uh, areas of erythema and plaques arising in usually young men. And the characteristic feature histologically, I hope you can see here, is uh, from the paper, is the lichenoid infiltrate is concentrated at the tips of the Riti ridges, which is intriguing uh, why that should be the case, and it is a consistent, fashion, a consistent observation. Uh, clinically, as you may guess from this, the differential diagnosis is often mycosis from Goldies or indeed morphia. Um, I'm coming towards the end now. Newcomb's disease, uh, also known as keratosis lichenoides chronica, is a rather enigmatic uh, dermatitis, which is of interest to me as we're, um, I'm working with some people on the paper on this at the moment. Um, typically, this has linear papules and plaques and reticulated papules and plaques in an adult. It is typically non-pruritic. Um, 
and it is of questionable nosological status. An exhaustive review in 2006 concluded that many cases in the literature were probably lichen planus or lupus erythematosus, or indeed lichen simplex chronicus, which despite the name is not lichenoid at all histologically, but nevertheless concluded there was a distinct entity, albeit ill-defined. What do we see? Well, a lichenoid histology, but parakeratosis, and numerous apoptotic keratinocytes, and often these changes affect the um, adnexal structures. Here's an example we had at St. John's of this gentleman with particulate uh, pigmentation, lace-like, particularly on the forearms, and a floridy lichenoid inflammatory pattern. So, Newcam's disease, keratosis lichenoides chronica, keep it in your differential diagnosis of atypical lichen planus, um, but also um, bear in mind those characteristic clinical features of reticulate or linear papules. Some genodermatoses can be lichenoid, uh, for example, Rothman Thompson syndrome, uh, poikular dermatous um, eruption. These patients often are short, they can be retarded. They have sparse hair and cataracts, and they are prone to malignancies. Here is a case we had in the actually presenting the photobiology unit uh, at St. John's. A young girl with some erythematous lesions on the cheeks and, uh, and bilateral on the arms. And the histology was almost indistinguishable to me from a lupus erythematosus. Very delicate lymphocytic infiltrate with a bit, uh, some superficial deep vascular inflammation, but. Uh, various genodermatoses with poikiloderma often have a lymphocytic infiltrate. For example, and I don't pretend to be an authority on poikiloderma with neutropenia, I do not know the disease, but I note, notice this um, publication, and again, here's another example of a poikiloderma rare dermatosis, but note the histology, again, it's lichenoid. So if you're seeing a lichenoid dermatitis in a rare setting or an unusual setting or a child, consider um, the diagnosis of a genodermatosis in poikiloderma. Um, the child I just showed you from St. John's actually was diagnosed on this stage. Kindler syndrome is another example. This is a well characterized one with a firm T1 gene uh, with poikiloderma, which is photosensitive. You can see the poikilodermatous areas here, and they are, uh, um, as they often are, um, these patients increase risk of malignancy. And here again, look at this florid lichenoid dermatitis. To finish, more or less, I couldn't finish without mentioning uh, mycosis fungoides, of course. Lichenoid mycosis fungoides is a very well-established pattern, histological pattern of mycosis fungoides. This is usually going to be at the patch or plaque stage, or at least that's the most relevant stage to consider the histology of lichenoid MF. Um, and the point about this is um, you rarely see collared bodies. You can, but you very rarely do, because this is not an autoimmune assault in the epidermis. These lymphocytes are living in the epidermis. Bearing in mind early stages of MF, the atypium may be minimal. This is a classic distribution, as you know, of mycosis from Gordy's pelvic hurdle. Now look at this beautiful lining up or tagging of um, atypical lymphocytes in the basal epidermal layer with no damage to the epidermis whatsoever. Please note, this is not vacuolar change in keratinocytes. These vacuo vacuolar change, this vacuolar change, is around the nuclei of the neoplastic T cells. So it's perinuclear halos, which are a characteristic feature. If you draw a line, you can draw the line around the dermal epidermal junction, which shows that actually basal epidermal damage is minimal. Of course, it was, it's never as easy as that, and here's an example which you can follow my arrow to the right here of the screen. This looks like a lichenoid dermatitis. There's damage, where's the stratum basalis? There's pigment incontinence. There are lymphocytes, and here's your portrait microabscess. But I would like to emphasize that this is the exception for the lichenoid pattern of MF outside popular dermatis MF rather than the norm. Finally, um, uh, almost finally, lichenoid actinic keratosis, of course, can have a um, florid lichenoid inflammatory cell infiltrate, and the key here is to notice dysplasia. More commonly, in my, well, not more commonly, but more interestingly, is the lichen planus like keratosis or lichenoid keratosis. This is a, a 
fairly common lesion, typically on the forearm. It is probably the end stage of a number of lesions, for example, a cellular intaglio, a SEPK, or a viral wart. And you see florid like node inflammation and numerous collared bodies, and often parakeratosis. And here is an example. You can see the hepatotic cells and the florid inflammation. And just in case um, we have some um, uh, younger members uh, watching today, this is a typical example just to illustrate something. Clinical history, query SEPK, query wart. You get this down and you look at it and the novice says, oh, it's like in plainness because look at this, beautifully like an oil, lymphocytes at junction, no parakeratosis. You can even pretend there's some hypergranulosis here if you wish. But the key is you never diagnose an inflammatory dermatosis if the clinical picture tells you it's a single lesion. Sorry, um, that is almost always uh, going to be the case. And that can apply for likelihood inflammation, the pattern of epidermolytic hyperkeratosis, and acanthalysis. You can see these as isolated phenomenon, and they do not mean the patient has a dermatitis. And that is particularly true of lichen planes like keratosis. So in summary, and I can't summarize in one slide, but just to recap, lichenoid inflammation is damage at the, the centered at the dermal epidermal junction. We see this in a variety of ways, lymphocytes at the dermal epidermal junction, vacuole change, and collar bodies. The respective contributions of those three parameters help you steer towards the correct diagnosis, but you also should pay um, considerable attention to other uh, histological features within the biopsy and as always with dermatic pathology, the clinical history is paramount. I'd like to acknowledge my clinical colleagues and pathology colleagues for some of the um, clinical sides in that presentation. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Wow, these are the sharks. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much, Alistair, for this uh, fantastic overview. It was really like to the force overview of uh, lichenoid uh, dermatosis and uh, I would like to open up the floor uh, for questions and you guys know that you can ask questions in the chat window uh, from Dr. Robson. In the meantime, you know, I, I have just a, a few questions uh, f for you that uh, do you consider like mucosal sites uh, like special sites? Uh, because you know sometimes uh, i think that in especially like we get specimens from the lip uh, you know if you are not looking at the requisition sheet and and uh, sometimes with very subtle lentigos or sometimes very very subtle hemangiomas that the patient is actually traumatizing uh, and rubbing and biting on, uh, due to the shearing effect, there will be a lichenoid reaction. What is your advice to be able to, and sometimes it is coming in as like uh, rule out lichen planus, rule out uh, ethnic keratosis, rule out leukoplakia. Do you have uh, any advice on histological uh, differential diagnosis, uh, how to get the right answer? Yeah. Um, well, you picked an, a difficult area. Um, I would say at the outset that um, dermatitis, uh, as, as I think you imply correctly, dermatitis on mucosal sites is a slightly different beast anyway. It is difficult. Um, they don't always manifest the same parameters or as clear cut as they do in non-mucosal sites, non-genital sites. I think in the instance you've just said, um, well, if you take the specific um, example. Um, lips particularly and insides of mouths, people chew on. They do. They run them over. They, it's a nervous habit that many of us do and you are going to get some irritation. Um, usually you will see quite marked focal acanthosis and you do get the impression that this is a localized response in many instances. Um, that to me is one of the most um, helpful features. Uh, secondly, it is unusual to get unilesial lichen planus. It, it, it is described, it does happen, but it is very unusual. So the fact that there is one lesion, and there we are dependent on a good clinical history, is also helpful in the same way that if they say it's bilateral is also helpful. Um, having said that, the pattern 
of the lymphoid infiltrate into the epidermis, I think I'd be lying if I said it was clearly cut different from um, cases of mucosal lichen planus. I think it can be extremely similar. So I think you have to pay attention to those other parameters. Thank you very much, because uh, this is uh, really sometimes uh, excruciating, uh, difficult, but I think uh, really to stick with the clinical could help a lot. The other thing is that I, uh, you mentioned uh, CD123 in the differential diagnosis. They even described CD123 to differentiate between dermatomyositis and uh, uh, lupus erythematosus, mm -hmm. the uh, pattern that uh, lupus has a deeper pattern with uh, CD123. Do you use CD123 or do you have any, uh, because I know that you are using uh, extensively immunohistochemistry, do you, do you uh, confirm yeah. these or, or, or do you use it? I mean, it, it, sometimes it feels a little bit esoteric to read about this, but do you think it is really useful on a day-to-day -day basis in the differential diagnosis? I, 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 I do use it in difficult cases and I find it useful, but of course, um, inevitably, um, the more you use it, the more you find the occasional exception. But nevertheless, it has a role. And in a case where I'm thinking I can't make my mind up or it's a bit tricky, if I find a lot of CD123 positive cells, I'm far more persuaded that I'm dealing with either Jesner's or lupus erythematosus. I actually, I, I'm aware of the paper you talked about, at least one paper at least, which discussed dermatomyositis versus lupus erythematosus. But I wasn't convinced by the paper. And I don't have a lot of experience in that setting. I have used it, and I, I, remain, I, I remain to be convinced on that. And the reason is, in many cases, when you see a deeper inflammatory cell infiltrate, where you see CD123 positive cells in lupus, you see those cells in the histology anyway, and that tends to be associated with lupus erythematosus rather than dermatomyositis anyway. So I think it's more the distribution of the cells rather than the fact they are... Um, uh, plasmacytodendritic cells, because both are present in dermatomyositis and lupus. So I, I, I don't have as much experience in that particular um, area, and I'm slightly more cynical about it. In terms of the other better, if you like, traveled or better reported um, instances of lupus erythematosus and jesners, a polymorphic light eruption, erythema chronica migrans, uh, um, that, I think, it does have a role, although um, there are cases that um, inevitably are not clear-cut. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, if you are looking at the paper that you presented, uh, which, which shows like zero, uh, you know, of, of, of this, uh, this plasmocytodendritic cells, this kind of makes me a little bit... Uh, yeah, I don't uh, believe that. Uh, no, I don't believe that, and I haven't found that. You will always find... You often... Find, not always. To be fair, sometimes you don't find any cell. But zero out of 27, I agree. You think, well... Um, and I can't recall, maybe you, you do, but I can't recall whether they used a cutoff, for example, 10% mm -hmm, or 20%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe but, the reason. Yeah, I, I think they may have done, and I can't remember. I, I, I don't buy that at all. I never buy things. I'm always suspicious, particularly with immuno. When you see things like that, I'm suspicious. Um, but in terms of florid numbers of CD123 cells, I do see that in lupus erythematosus, and I find that useful, therefore, if I see it. But if I see one or two cells or an occasional cluster of a cell, that will not put me off. That, that, that's not enough for me to say, well, this couldn't possibly be polymorphous light eruption. I, I agree with you on that. I see. Well, Alistair, thank you so much. I would like to ask again, you know, the audience, if, if anyone would like to ask a question, because we are talking to the expert and then and, and this is a great uh, time and opportunity to ask a question from him. It is getting late uh, back in Europe. Uh, so if, if you have, I, I have one more question, maybe if I may uh, ask you about this. Uh, did you have uh, cases of this annular lichenoid uh, uh, dermatosis yes. of childhood or, or youth, uh, do you? If I, if I have, um, Laszlo, I've missed it. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not aware. But I don't believe, and I'll tell you why I don't believe I've missed it, because I don't know whether it came across on the screen, but the histology is so, so uh, characteristic 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that reachy reach pattern. Now I've seen a case, interestingly, that didn't have a diagnosis. Um, we didn't get to the bottom of a diagnosis. It didn't have lymphocytes at the tips of the reachy ridges, but had widespread, not widespread, but um, apoptosis of the reachy ridge tips across the biopsy, mm -hmm. which in a sense is the same process. It's just apoptosis rather than lymphocytes. It is a lichen or infiltrate. But clinically, um, we never got to the bottom of it, unfortunately. We weren't able to find out the details. So I don't have experience, The um, as you saw from the clinical and repeatedly stated in the papers describing it, the clinical differential you have to worry about is um, mycosis fungoides and indeed morphia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I came across a case uh, uh, recently that the clinical was, uh, or a clinical is actually a, a very good uh, for that diagnosis with the age of the patient. The funny thing about it is uh, that there is also a peri uh, nexa mainly, uh, you know, uh, sweat gland infiltrate like you see in blushkitis, but the uh, the clinical absolutely not fits with a lichen striatus sort or of brush kitis pattern. And that's why I was like, uh, I uh, was asking that, have you seen maybe, you know, also this uh, periacrine uh, lymphoid infiltrate or not? Because the clinical would be actually good uh, and with the superficial lichenoid infiltrate, good for that condition. But well, that, that's interesting. I mean, having said that, it is quite a um, striking clinical picture. And I think if you have that clinical picture and you've got the lichenoid inflammation, deep uh, period nexal wouldn't put me off. It isn't just, um, you don't just see that in blush gaitis lichen striatus. It's described in lichen planus as well, actually, in some variants. So to me, um, as with the approach in any, any um, um, difficult case. If everything adds up but one thing seems rather anomalous, I accept the anomaly. I see, I see. Well, you know, for, for the audience, I would like to kind of emphasize the, uh, the benefit and the uh, great opportunity of having uh, such an international expert, Dr. Robson, and there will be a uh, other uh, very well-known experts on the program. And this is an opportunity to, to ask the questions that uh, never come or rarely come uh, to you. So please uh, try to capitalize on it because, you know, this kind of discussions, this insight that he's providing for us is is, is not just be uh, uh, not just uh, uh, over the textbooks that we have on our shelves. It is uh, even more than the recent journal articles that we are reading because this is uh, decades of personal experience and uh, the audience can tap into that uh, experience by asking questions. And with that, uh, I would like to ask, I mean, I would like to say, uh, Alistair, that uh, we are absolutely grateful for you for this uh, superb lecture and, uh, you know, uh, giving uh, your time to us. I know that you are hyper, hyper busy or as you usually uh, mm -hmm. send an email that you are uber busy. And uh, so for that reason, uh, we greatly uh, thank you for your time and, and this excellent lecture. And we hope uh, you will have a nice trip to India and we would really love to have you back, you know, some other lectures uh, of like lymphomas. Of course, I would like to. Thank you very much, Laszlo, and good night, everybody. Good night to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.